I'd like to introduce uh, Brett Harrison, uh, the president of, of FTX US. Hello, Amy Rose, I can see you on the screen. Uh, he's an extraordinary person doing extraordinary things with that business. The business has launched an Australian arm. Uh, if you were tuning in on Monday, again, it's, it's a business that is only a matter of a number of years uh, old, and it has been an amazing thing to observe how quickly that business has grown, and it's taking on the world, which again is the, the reciprocal opportunity. They can take on the world, and we can take on the world ourselves. So uh, we welcome them. They are a naming rights sponsor. Um, they move extraordinarily quickly to take the opportunity. So, uh, Brett, I'll hand over to you and, uh, and look forward to uh, the view from afar. You go right ahead whenever you're ready, Brett. Amy, could you unmute? You're good, we can hear you. Okay, on now. Yes, hi. Good to go? Okay, great. All right, hello everyone. Thanks so much uh, for coming to my talk. It's, I'm calling in here from uh, Chicago, Illinois in the United States. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking for all of you today. So I'm gonna talk about uh, NFTs. Uh, obviously a very exciting topic of the day. And, but before I do, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about FTX um, and tell you a little bit about our global company. So first, FTX was an exchange that was founded around three years ago. I know you guys talked with uh, Sam Bankman-Fried yesterday, our founder, and it was founded as a global cryptocurrency derivatives exchange. And, oh, sorry, I'm getting a lot of uh, music in my ear from the stadium piping in. Sorry, I don't know if uh, Amy or someone else on the line can help uh, fix that. I'm just gonna mute them if I can. Okay, so FTX was founded around three years ago. It's a global cryptocurrency exchange, and its primary uh, market has been in the derivative space. And it's grown to the second or third largest exchange in the world. And around a year and a half ago, we also launched a U.S. business. And uh, the U.S. business grew from you know, nothing to being one of the fourth, fourth or fifth largest exchange in the United States. And we offer a, a variety of different products. We have our uh, spot crypto offering, where we do around 300 million a day in spot crypto. We recently acquired a, a CFTC, a Commodity Futures and Trading Commission in the United States licensed derivatives exchange with the goal of offering crypto derivatives to US customers. And we'll probably talk more about uh, regulation around crypto and crypto derivatives later on uh, at Blockchain Australia. And we also built last year uh, an NFT marketplace. So it was the first ever NFT marketplace to house both Ethereum and Solana NFTs in the same marketplace. Uh, it's also the first you know, custodial marketplace that is also uh, free of transaction fees when you're interacting on the platform. And I'm looking forward to talking to you guys more about that and our vision for NFTs with the platform. But first, I know everyone here has been talking about NFTs all day, um, but I thought perhaps there are some people in the audience who they sort of kind of get what NFTs are, but maybe don't know fundamentally what they are. So I thought I would start a little bit from the beginning and work our way up through FTX and what our vision is. So when you think about a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, it was programmed into Bitcoin that there would be a certain number of tokens ever in existence for Bitcoin. In fact, the number is 21 million. So if I have a Bitcoin and you have a Bitcoin, we have the same fundamental thing. You can't really distinguish them apart and they're part of a fixed supply that's greater than one. In this case, it's 21 million. And we can freely fund between mine and yours. So they're completely fungible. It doesn't really matter. You can't distinguish one Bitcoin from another. Now imagine instead you are creating a cryptocurrency where instead of there being 21 million of the coins, there was only one, only one ever in existence. And because there's only one and it's not divisible, you can't have a quarter of it or a half of it or three quarters of it that one NFT can only belong to one person at a time. 
and no one else's token is the same as yours, which means it's non-fungible with anything else. And that's all a non-fungible token is, is a cryptocurrency. It's a, a, a currency on some blockchain that only has one of it ever in existence. And usually it's identified by some sort of unique address. And that address helps define exactly what that token is. It distinguishes it from any other one. Now we could stop there, of course, but what makes NFTs interesting is that because there's only one of it and you can prove that you are the owner of that token by, for example, cryptographically signing a transaction from a wallet that indicates that you're the owner of that token, well, that means that you can prove ownership. And that's what's so powerful about NFTs is the idea for the first time in really our digital history, we have this really easy to use, very powerful technology, and yet it's very simple, which is that with this one token, you can prove that you're the only person in the world that owns that token. So naturally from here, just having the token alone wasn't super interesting. It's what you can do with it. So the first thing people really did with these tokens is attach data to the token. So for example, attaching an image or a movie or a song or an experience. So for example, taking an NFT and being able to use it as a ticket into some sort of gated experience like a concert or getting into a Discord channel that only holders of the NFT can get into. And this all works again because NFTs have given us a way of digitally and cryptographically proving that you are the only owner in the world of that particular token. So with the advent of NFTs, the first real consumer application was in art and people selling NFTs in the form of collections of art, usually either that's a single piece of art sold as a digital NFT or a collection of NFTs as part of some theme. For example, a Board 8 Yacht Club which are 10,000 different images that are part of a, symbol, a, a, a single collection. And those started to pop up in marketplaces where people wanted to be associated with them. They wanted to be the only ones that owned them. They were either a symbol of status or they got you into some sort of special event or a club, or it was just that people really loved the artwork and wanted to own it. And they wanted to be able to show off online that they're the only ones who owned that particular thing. Now, most NFTs, unlike cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency derivatives, trade DeFi. So what do I mean by that? Well, on exchanges like FTX and Binance and Coinbase, when you trade a crypto, all those trades are really happening off chain. The only on-chain transactions are when people are depositing crypto onto the platform or withdrawing from the platform but the peer-to-peer -peer trading that happens on the platform is all happening off-chain. And that's because of efficiency and speed. Think of any millions of transactions happen per day on FTX. If every single one of those had to pay transaction fees and wait for them to complete, it would take a very long time. And we wouldn't be able to have the kind of uh, throughput and the low cost that we have associated with the centralized marketplace. Now, of course, there are decentralized marketplaces out there. There are DEXs on various different blockchains. Um, but by and large, most of the trading in the world in crypto happens on a centralized exchange. But that is not true with NFTs. NFTs primarily trade DeFi. And some of the largest marketplaces include OpenSea. Um, and now on the Solana side, places like Magic Eden. These are marketplaces where the only thing you need to do to trade is connect a non-custodial wallet like MetaMask or Phantom. And immediately you can just take the currency that you have in your wallet and exchange it for an NFT on the marketplace or bid for an NFT on the marketplace. Now, this presents two problems for the future of NFTs. One is around transaction fees. So with a smart contract-based NFT marketplace, which is what, for example, OpenSea is, every single action like listing an NFT for sale or bidding on an NFT requires sending a function call to a smart contract, which means doing a transaction on the Ethereum network, which you therefore have to pay the transaction fee for. So even things like submitting a bid for NFT, which you might not win, might cost you $30 just to do so. Also, you have to wait for 
the Ethereum network to confirm your transaction, which could take many seconds or even over a minute. On FTX, what we did was we built the first ever custodial marketplace where all of the NFT transactions, except for depositing and withdrawing, are happening off chain. That means that if you go onto the platform right now and you want to buy an NFT and you already have, let's say, Ether in your wallet and you want to buy a board ape, you can do so instantly without paying any transaction fee as a result. The second important thing that DeFi marketplaces are missing is compliance. So right now, NFT trading is happening without any intermediary worrying about who those users are, which is important for the, the spirit and the ethos of DeFi. But imagine you were to go into a Sotheby's auction house and want to buy a Van Gogh painting. You cannot do that with a credit card and not you know, presenting your passport or your social security number. You, we, it is important for regulation and for anti-money laundering for people to be identified if they're making transactions over a certain amount. But right now, you can go on to OpenSea and buy a CryptoPunk for over a million dollars and never show an ID. And that's going to be a problem in the future for marketplaces that want to be compliant with things like AML and sanctions requirements of governments. And so this is another important part of our marketplace is that we apply the same rules and regulations and identity protections around our NFT marketplace that we do for our normal cryptocurrency marketplaces. So why does this, any of this matter? Well, one thing that we have really bet on for the future of NFTs is the idea of the white label. So just backing up a little bit, Let's talk a little bit about what FTX really is. We have this user interface where people can go on, they can buy and sell crypto. But at its core, FTX is a set of services. Those services include things like being able to connect to a bank account and letting people deposit AUD or USD from their actual bank account directly onto the platform. It includes things like connecting to blockchains and being able to understand deposits and withdrawals of cryptocurrencies. It is an API by which people can receive events that happen on the platform for free. That we call that market data. So if you want to see every trade that's occurred in the Bitcoin order book, or you want to see all the bids on some NFT, those are all examples of things that you can subscribe to via an application programming interface and get that information for free. It also has an API for going the other direction, which is to be able to place orders, to cancel orders, um, to be able to list things for sale. And it's through those services that we built the, for example, the FTX app or the FTX Pro mobile app or the FTX.com website. All those things really are, are just user interfaces that are just really thin wrappers around the core services that are provided by FTX at its core. Well, what we realized was we don't have to be the only ones that consume those services. We can let other applications, other marketplaces, other different kinds of fintech services take our crypto services and include them in the back end of their product and provide them to their clients. So here's an example of this. In the United States, there's an app called StockTwits. And StockTwits is a social investing app and it's one where you can buy and sell stocks like Apple and Tesla and Microsoft. And there's a social element to it where you can you know, post on Twitter for the trades that you're doing and you can share and you know, create these communities around the trading that you're doing. Well, StockTwits wanted to give people the opportunity to trade Bitcoin and Ether and Solana and these different cryptocurrencies alongside stocks like Tesla and Apple. But they did not have the licenses required to provide crypto trading technology. Uh, they also just didn't have the technology itself. They would have had to go out and build that all themselves. So instead they contracted with us to take those crypto services and package them up inside the StockTwits app and provide them to their users in the form of a white label. So it's underneath their app, their brands, but they get to benefit from all of the services that we provide in the back end, like creating and managing wallets. Um, storing large amounts of assets in some combination of hot and cold wallet storages, being able to connect to all the blockchains, being able to connect to all the different banks, providing this API. 
So that's exactly where we are going to head with NFTs. There are different companies out there that want to be able to leverage NFT technology in some way. And who knows where NFTs are going to head over the next one, two, five years. You know, NFTs clearly are going to be used for art. We already see a lot of that playing out already in marketplaces like OpenSea and FTX. It's also going to be used for music. We're at the very beginning stages of that, seeing people who want to engage their fans in a particular way that's above them just downloading their song. Maybe they want to give them the ability to you know, enter into a private concert in the metaverse if they get their particular song as an NFT. We saw Snoop Dogg uh, release a mixtape that was gated behind you know, NFTs on OpenSea. So there's exciting applications for music. But beyond that, there are things like real estate. We recently saw some of the first global real estate transactions happen in the form of NFTs, where the NFT itself was a deed to the actual you know, estate that was being purchased. We'll see NFTs being used for things like loans and contracts in the future. But a huge thing that we think is going to happen with NFTs and is already happening is in the area of gaming. So I'm sure you guys have all heard of Axie Infinity, this blockchain-based game where the actual characters themselves, which sort of resemble Pokemon, are actually NFTs that you have to purchase to be able to play with the game. And the rewards for, for example, winning a uh, PvP battle is, are, are take the form of actual cryptocurrencies. And people are using the game as a way of actually earning income, whether that's actually earning the fungible tokens through playing the game, or it's through growing the capabilities of their non-fungible tokens, their characters, and then selling those on a marketplace. Now, we think that blockchain-based gaming, um, within blockchain-based gaming, play-to-earn mechanics like Axie Infinity will represent a pretty small amount of the total universe of how games might integrate with blockchain technology. There are some games that, that will actually you know, grow up and be created entirely around the concept of NFTs and blockchains. But in, we also know that there are large game studios and small and medium-sized game studios as well who have existing very successful games where they put a lot of thought into the art and the story and the plot and the graphics and everything that goes into making a very successful, engaging game. And they would like to add some marketplace elements to it. So right now, there is a multi-billion dollar industry for people who are buying in-game items of various kinds, whether those are you know, loot boxes or skins or you know, for avatars. And money can go into games, but it really can't come out because all of these game economies are fairly walled off within the confines of the game. So what you see is this sort of gray market that's popped up for game items. And here's an example. Someone could level up a character in a game, get them to be some you know, very high level, and then go on eBay, and offer to sell that character on eBay. And what does selling that character mean? Well, it means probably putting a login and password into a text file and then selling that text file over email to someone who wants to pay to have that character. Well, that's not a very secure way of creating a marketplace. It's also a very opaque way of creating a marketplace. How do you do price discovery in that market when you have all these disparate sellers who are not coming together in sort of a managed, uh, fairly regulated space of showing you know, what different auctions are available for you know, different characters in a way that would be transparent and allow for marketplace dynamics to play a role. That's exactly what NFTs can do for this space. Imagine instead if you connected your wallet to a game and what skins or what characters you had available were based on what NFTs you had in your wallet, and yes, you can maybe trade those NFTs in the game, but you can also trade them on generic marketplaces. And all of a sudden there can be real price discovery, real market-based dynamics that would come from being able to establish the same kinds of principles you can in normal crypto markets, but just with these in-game items. So we're having these very interesting discussions right now as a company at FTX, where we recently established this gaming unit as a subset of FTX, where we are working with game studios to help explore different ways of using FTX's services and their game design expertise to bring blockchain and crypto-based elements to their game. And just seven hours ago, we released some big news from FTX, which is that FTX just acquired a game studio 
called Good Luck Games. And Good Luck Games has made as their first game um, a game called Storybook Brawl, which is an online card-based auto battler. Um, and it has this amazing artwork, this great lore behind it. It's super fun to play. Uh, as a game, FTX people really fell in love with not just the game, but this amazing team behind it of people who we've actually known for quite some time. Um, uh, there's been connections between you know, people in the company and people in the studio for quite some time outside of just work. And they have such a great vision for not just designing a really fun and free to play game, but also for thinking about how to tastefully and carefully add blockchain elements to the game that will bring it to a new level. For example, maybe you could be the only person in the world who owns some super rare card that then you can use in the game because you have that NFT in your wallet. And that's the kind of thing we want to establish. What we, what we don't want to have happen is for the advent of, of blockchain technology to turn every game into work. And I think that's what a lot of people are afraid of, where a you know, play to earn necessarily means that all, no games will be fun anymore. Everything will be about money and investment and and you have to have a PhD in economics to understand all the tokenomics behind making a game work. And that's, of course, not going to be the way that blockchain and gaming uh, really develop together. What we instead expect to see are things like a free-to-play game where most players never need to even think about crypto. Um, they just want to play the game for free. They want to enjoy it. They want to have fun. They want to you know, pay to play to, to download the game at first, but they want this sort of like free experience to keep playing and investing in it. But there's going to be that hardcore group of niche users who are going to want to actually monetize their attention into that game. And so they'll be the ones who are going to be thinking hard about the tokenomics of the in-game token. They're going to be thinking hard about how to maximize the investment in their characters, in their skins, in the in-game gold and gems and different you know, weapons and add-ons to their characters that will become something that they can actually take outside the game and trade. And so we're really excited to work now with Good Luck Games and to bring Storybook Brawl eventually, and who knows what time horizon this will be, into a world where it's not just this a really awesome, fun to play game, but different maybe spin-offs that will, will result from the incredible lore being built up within the game, but also will have these blockchain elements and hopefully will be a real shining example of how to do this right, about how to integrate the, the new world of crypto and NFTs and marketplaces that we can develop in this interesting manner and bring that alongside all the fun and interesting aspects of games, which is this ever-growing industry. So just to conclude here, FTX, we have this great marketplace. It has Solana NFTs, it has Ethereum NFTs, and we're growing that a lot and we're hoping to bring on more interesting exclusive NFTs in the platform through our various partnerships with with sports teams and celebrities and also different connections we have with the art communities. And we're very excited to continue to grow that. But we're also really excited about the next step, the next phase of NFTs adoption, which is being able to bring NFTs into some more mainstream type of entertainment space like games. And so with that, I'll, I'll conclude and really wanna thank everyone for having me here at uh, Blockchain Australia. And I'm um, looking forward to speak to you guys more about things like regulation uh, later in the week, actually, I think tomorrow. Um, but please feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, I'm at Brett underscore FTX US on Twitter. Uh, all the people on the FTX team are pretty open about what we're doing, what we're working on. We're super excited to answer any questions or field ideas you guys have. We're very excited to be officially be licensed in Australia and really appreciate all the staff for everyone and everyone for having us uh, involved in this event. And thank you all very much. Thanks, Britt.